Hello everyone, I'm Thersites the Historian, and it is time to take out the trash. When in the course of human events someone makes an overwrought, under-researched, and poorly reasoned attempt to compare the politics of modernity with the politics of antiquity, someone has to step in and point out that the shitty comparison was in fact a shitty comparison, and that person is yours truly. So, in Taking Out the Trash Part 2, we will do effectively the same thing that we did in Part 1. Look at a really shitty attempt to compare the past with the present, and explain exactly why the shitty attempt was shitty. Today's entertainer is one Marion L. Tupi. Despite having the name Marion, the author is in fact a man. We'll see his picture at the end. The article is entitled... Is America heading down the road to Roman ruin? Like a latter-day Marius, Barack Obama has subjected the American constitutional order to a relentless barrage of unconstitutional acts. So, he's taking a little different tact here. It's not the usual, the liberals are all Caesar or the Gracchi brothers, and the Republicans are the helpless senators who watched as the world they loved crumbled before them. And they were completely blameless, I guess. So, at first I thought maybe this will be interesting. And I was very curious about how someone could possibly compare Barack Obama and Gaius Marius. Since, if I had to think of anyone from the ancient world who would be analogous with Obama, it would be hard. But it certainly would not be Gaius Marius. So anyway... Let's see what Mr. Tupi has for us here. Remember the story of an ambitious Roman general who marched his army on Rome, thereby destroying the ancient republic? So he's giving us the Caesar fake, even though he already gave away the game in the subtitle. So this is what we'd call a clever hook or attempt to mislead someone to show them that there are other figures in history you're aware of. But the effect is thrown away by the fact that the subtitle of the article shows to any reader who understands basic chronology that we're really talking about the period a few decades before Caesar rose to prominence. When the events that this article will cover took place, Caesar was a teenager and then he was passing into his early 20s. So he was not one of the great men of influence in Rome. Chances are, Many a reader will think of Gaius Julius Caesar, the conqueror of Gaul, vanquisher of Pompey, and lover of the Egyptian Queen Cleopatra, who had himself declared dictator for life and was assassinated on the floor of the Roman Senate on the Ides of March in 44 BC. Well, technically he was assassinated in Pompey's theater because the Senate house was still destroyed after uh, Clodius's followers used the Senate House to serve as a funeral pyre, but, you know, close enough. Some of these details aren't all that important. And now the big shift, because I thought it was going to be an extended analogy for why Marius and Obama are the same and both threaten the constitutional order. But now we're using an indirect comparison to Trump, although clearly, as we'll see later on, this guy, while he admires Sulla, has a lot of reservations about Donald Trump. So it's a very disjunctive, kind of poorly fitted article all around, where this guy clearly has a lot of mixed feelings and wasn't exactly sure where he wanted to go with this. Alas, the hero of this column is someone altogether different. Lucius Cornelius Sulla Felix, was a man large enough to contain multitudes. He was a bon vivant, with a seemingly endless appetite for food and drink. He was married to a succession of five women while carrying on a lifelong love affair with another man. So, of course, he uses heroes and uh, scare quotes to show that while he admires some things about Sulla, he might be a little bit horrified by Sulla's libertine ways. The thing is, a lot of Sulla's bon vivant lifestyle was probably a little bit exaggerated because when Sulla was already a middle-aged man, he didn't really have any blemishes on his skin and he was known to be very handsome. And if this guy really was parting it up and getting completely hammered on the daily 
then I doubt that he would still look good in his like late 40s or early 50s. So, you know, probably not as big of a partier as Mr. Toopy is portraying him here. I've never heard the story about a lifelong love affair with another man. Um, not sure where that came from. It's been a little while since I've read Plutarch's Life of Sulla, so maybe that's where that came from. But also, yeah, Sulla wasn't fat, so he probably did have some end to his appetite, I have to imagine. And he was a vigorous campaigner. So he's a guy who was capable of going without the pleasures of life when he needed to. So, yeah, anyway. Sulla was born to an impoverished but patrician family in 138 BC. To a general audience, I think it's safe to say the word patrician means very little. It might just sound like it's a family like the Bush family, a family with a pedigree in the generic sense. I don't think most modern readers will pick up on the meaning and significance of what patrician meant in the Roman context. Having joined the army, he distinguished himself in Numidia, where he captured Rome's foremost enemy, King Jugurtha. Other military triumphs, both in the provinces and in Italy's social war, followed. These led to a successful political career and an election to the consulship, Rome's highest elected office in 88 BC. So the thing is, it wasn't the, so- the military successes in the social war that led to his political career. He was consul during the social war. He already had a very successful political career before it broke out. Even without the social war, he was a very successful and highly thought of politician. And a lot of that is because when he captured Jugurtha, he was acting as Marius's subordinate officer, and then he took credit for the entire affair, whereas the normal state of affairs was for subordinates to credit their superiors. And because Marius was a new man who had sort of, in a way, betrayed Metellus Numidicus, who was his old benefactor and former commander, Sulla got a lot of backing from other well-heeled patricians and traditionalists in the Senate. And a lot of this became a big personal rivalry between Marius and Sulla. Especially when the social war broke out, Marius is still an active general, although he's way past his prime, and Sulla is the new man of the hour. But they're basically the best and second best generals of the war. Maybe third best for Marius, because... Pompey Strabo, the father of Pompey the Great, was also in the war, and he did well. But at any rate, uh, there is a lot of political rivalry that you have to understand for this to make sense. And it's not as if Sulla made his name solely through military exploits. He was a patrician, which means that he was part of the highest social order in Rome. He was well-connected. And his family's fortunes did recover at this time, which enabled him to pursue a political career. Once in power, actually sort of before that, because Sulla had a lot of charisma and ability, Sulla became the focus of patrician or optimite opposition to the growing strength of the populares represented by Gaius Marius. I'll allow it because sometimes I do this too, but technically the terms optimites and populares didn't really emerge into their full meaning until about the 60s BCE. So here it's being used a little bit anachronistically, but it's not too bad of an error. And like I said, sometimes just for the sake of convenience and because people kind of know what these words mean, I will sometimes myself use those words in videos about Romans. Sulla was a staunch conservative, committed to law and order, and to scrupulous interpretation of the Roman Constitution. Okay, staunch conservative I will give you, but nothing after that. As we'll see, Sulla's most famous actions were marching on Rome twice. Now granted, the second time, Marius's subordinates or surviving supporters were opposing him in arms, so you could say that in that case it might be justified, but the first time, this had never happened. And the action that Marius took, which caused Sulla to march on Rome, while unusual, was actually not unprecedented or unconstitutional. So, Sulla was very willing to innovate and reinterpret the Constitution when he needed to. Make no mistake about it. Law and order was something that he valued when it favored him. 
When it didn't favor him, he was willing to go a different direction. So keep all of that in mind. And actually, Mr. Toopy basically tells us this. Yet, in order to accomplish his political goals, he unleashed an epic reign of terror and broke many a constitutional precedent. So he's not a defender of the Constitution. By definition, if you break many constitutional precedents, you cannot restore the earlier Constitution because now you have forever changed the way that people will view it. Of course. I mean, is not is this not obvious? He tried to excise the Roman body politic, the cancerous legacy of Gaius Marius, but failed to revive the dying republic. So, the thing is, Marius' legacy is actually pretty complex. Marius was the guy who professionalized the Roman legions, and the reason why he did this is very important. The Gracchi had tried to reform Rome with a view to making land ownership more equitable. As Mr. Tupi himself will cover later on, the Roman system of recruitment was based on land ownership. If you owned a certain amount of land, you were liable to military service. The problem was that land was being concentrated in the fewer and fewer hands, which meant you had fewer and fewer soldiers available, while the wars were being fought further and further away from Rome as the Republic expanded. So that meant that for the men who were left in the ranks, the burden on them was getting much, much heavier, and they had a lot less time to spend with their families and running their farms. And at the same time, it meant that there was a large homeless population building up in Rome, or people who were sort of marginally employed, so that's never a good thing, at least urban unrest. And it also hurts Roman military readiness. It hurts the farmers. It's not really good for anyone except the large landowners, who are also senators, who are buying up a bunch of land. And also, when you're gone for a long time and you leave your farm in the hands of your wife and young kids, maybe elderly father or something like that, it will not be farmed as well. Your profits go down. Maybe you're in the middle of a bad year agriculturally. You're forced to sell your land. Now you're semi employed in Rome and you have no farm, therefore you're also not serving anymore. So all the experience you have is useless for the Republic. And the Gracchi wanted to address that by taking the Agor Publicus and redistributing it to some landless men in Rome who had fallen prey to having their land bought up by rich people, sometimes the same guys who had led them in battle in Spain and other far-flung locations. So keep that in mind. Also, Marius ideologically was basically just an egotist. He took the cause of the people up because there was no other cause for him to go with. I think if the conservative faction had embraced him, he would have probably just gone with them. He was a new man, though, so that he didn't have the pedigree, and they scorned him. But I don't think he was an inherently populist figure, really. I think he was just a guy looking for an avenue that would get him to power and glory. So Marius, at least so far as I can tell, was not an ideologue of any kind. And many ancient figures are not, but Marius is probably one of the less ideological out of these figures, most of whom are very non-ideological to begin with. A constitution, once compromised, is difficult to restore by the force of arms. Hey, at least Mr. Tupi doesn't believe in the power of coups, so credit where credit's due in the wake of January 6th. It must be defended by the vigilance and application of a knowledgeable and concerned citizenry. Therein lies a lesson for the U.S. presidential election next Tuesday. I got a lot to say about this little paragraph. First of all, this article was published on Election Day, November 8th, so Mr. Tupi submitted his article at least a week early. And this means that his editor held it out because he thought, man, this is some profound shit and it's going to hit like an atomic bomb when we drop it on election day. But the author, Mr. Tupi, thought that this article would be necessary information for voters. Yet, very few voters would have gotten to read this before voting. So, good job, Cato Institute. You really nailed it on this. There was a perfect connection between writer and editor. Also, let's think about what a constitution is for a second. 
For us, in the modern world, a constitution is a formal written document with the force of law. That is not what the ancient people meant by constitution. The Greek word politeia actually translates closer to something like way of life. It is related to the word polis, which encompasses more than just the political realm. For them, it is everything. If you notice when Aristotle describes the Athenian constitution, he talks about customs which are not necessarily political. He talks about households and some other stuff. He talks about a little bit of Athenian history, some of the mythical figures of Athens, some of the gods and goddesses. And if you look at a another historian such as, say, Herodotus or Polybius or someone else who goes into culture, they do not necessarily separate politics and culture or politics and social norms. For them, all of these things are a part of the politeia. The Romans were similar, and I wish I could remember the Latin term that they used. But at any rate, they do not see the Constitution as either narrowly political, nor do they see it necessarily as law. They see it as a combination of laws and then norms. And of course, norms can and are broken. Even the Romans, who prided themselves on being arch-traditionalist, often broke norms or changed norms to fit with the times. By the time of Sulla and Marius, for instance, many things in the Roman Republican Constitution had been changed. We think that in the early Republic, the office of Praetor was a senior magistracy, but that had changed fairly early on. Consuls were now the senior magistrates. The number of, say, Praetors and Tribunes had increased. The Office of Tribune had risen up within a fairly early time in the Republic to represent the plebs better. The plebs also just won representation in general, and plebs got access to the consulship. There were a lot of changes that took place between the foundation of the Republic and the time of Marius and Sulla. Marius's changes were not the first time that someone had made a fundamental or major change to the way that Rome did business. And we'll get more into the changes in the powers of the Tribune and then the Curse of Norum later on. But needless to say, all of those things changed over time. And as for constitutions needing to be defended by the vigilance and application of a knowledgeable and concerned citizenry, I like the sentiment and I want to agree with this. The problem is that if you're trying to apply this to the present, you have to understand that our politics is dominated by money. If you're not a moneyed interest, you have no real influence in politics. It's even hard to influence the primaries of the parties at this point. How often do insurgent candidates win? Not too often. Also, it was even less uh, likely in the past, in the, at least in the Roman Republic, for a concerned citizen to really be able to influence politics. If you look at the way the Roman system was set up, it was very much an oligarchy. They could vote, but if you're not wealthy, your vote counted for way less. Rome had 35 voting tribes. The 18 wealthiest tribes, which were smaller, got the vote first. So if there was a conflict of class interest between two candidates, all the rich people got the vote first, and despite being far fewer in numbers, they were not only guaranteed to get the vote since they got to go first, and sometimes it took a long time for everybody to process. But if all of them decided to vote their class interest, well, it was game over and the poor people were just sent home because there was no point from the vote. They had already been outvoted. So, keep all this in mind. If you are a concerned Roman citizen who maybe you're just wealthy enough to have leisure to follow politics, you attend all the major court cases and public speeches, and you're concerned about constitutional degradation... The only thing that you can do is nothing. You can complain to people, and you can actually meet with, say, the tribunes. But if you were, say, a conservative, you would think the tribunes are a mutation of the system, a cancer. So you wouldn't do shit. <laughs> um, that's what you would do. You would do nothing if you were a Marian Tupi-style Roman. Okay? Like Sulla... Marius joined the army at an early age. Roman senators did not join the army, quote-unquote. They would serve 
because they had a service obligation and they would do this as young men in their 20s and then they would embark upon a military career when they had a had served a sufficient number of years. For Marius as a new man, he needed this more than Sulla's. He was much more close to something like a professional soldier. But there were no professional soldiers. There was no quote-unquote army to join. The Roman forces were levied every year by the consuls, as needed. And all adult males up to about age 60 were eligible. And then the men were sort of hand-selected at this period. So neither of them could join the army in the modern sense. Unlike Sulla, Marius was an equestrian by birth and his political sympathies lay with the plebs. Technically speaking, all senators are equestrian by birth. You're not a senator until you're elected to your first office, which is usually the office of Keister. So, yeah, uh, technically speaking, both of them are equestrian, but what equestrian means in effect is that your family has money. So, Marius, although he is, I guess, more popular than Sulla in the sense of not being from one of these hoity-toity families, we should not think of him as a common man, because he most certainly was not. Sulla would be in the very, very, very top echelon of Roman society, and then Marius is maybe just a rung or two above him. But from the ground perspective of being, say, a semi-employed worker in Rome, there's not a hell of a lot of difference between Marius and Sulla in terms of their social standing. It matters not a jot to you that Marius has more famous ancestors or that, excuse me, the other way around, Sulla has more famous ancestors than Marius. Both of them are fabulously wealthy, have never worked a day in their lives, and get to exercise political power, and you don't. Elected as a tribune of the plebs in 120 BC, he pushed through a number of electoral reforms that curtailed the power of the aristocracy and annoyed the optimates. Well, there's a good reason he did that. The man was a careerist, and if you don't curb the power of the well-born patricians, then it makes it hard for you to rise to power. This was incredibly popular with many of the people who sometimes saw the optimates as being douchebags. So it kind of worked in Marius's favor. Also, although this author likes to present the patricians as all being conservative, Julius Caesar was a patrician, and he was not very conservative. So, it is a little more complex than all that. And I'll have to remember to challenge all of the many assumptions that Marion Tupi makes here. Marius's political career continued to flourish and culminated in the consulship of 107 BC. That was only after he had to leave the army of Metellus, of, uh, Metellus Numidicus in a huff after Metellus, who had been his friend and whom he had served very well, told him, hey man, I know that we've been buds for a while and that you've helped me out here in Africa, but you should really wait until my son, who's only 20, runs for consul another 20 years. You'll be old as fuck by then. But you really should wait in line because you're just not that important based on your family name. So you need to know your role. So Marius rightfully got enraged, went to Rome, ran for consul and won, and then replaced Metellus. And that's part of why Sulla, who was also a fellow patrician like Metellus, was felt empowered to just tell Marius to go fuck himself and try to steal credit for capturing Jugurtha. As consul, Marius pushed through a set of military reforms that fatally undermined the Roman constitution and ultimately doomed the Republic. Okay, big pause. When Marius was consul, after he won in Africa, because he finished off the Juggerthine War, came back to Rome, got reelected, and the reason why he was reelected back to back to back to back is because there was a crisis in the north with the Cimbri and the Teutonis. These were two Gallic tribes that the Romans feared, and they inflicted a massive defeat at a place called Arausio. And the traditional Roman army wasn't cutting it anymore. At least that was the perception. So Marius decided to reform the army. He needed a standing force that he could train. He also knew that recruits were limited because of Rome's refusal to do land reform because senators and their wealthiest backers would have to give up properties they had bought. So 
Marius decided to work around that, to circumvent the greed of the Senate by creating a standing professional army. So he made it to where the Roman state itself would issue arms and armor, rather than relying on farmers to buy their own stuff. And this did, I think, in some ways weaken the Republic in the sense that the old system of levies with no permanent standing army was more flexible and meant that there were more potential soldiers. So this gave Rome the kind of flexibility and bench that it had in the Second Punic War. But the Roman legions under Marius, the professional legions, were definitely more efficient. The problem is that they become much, much harder to replace. So ultimately, that system will continue into the empire, and the empire will have a higher state, of, a higher standard of excellence and readiness. But it will come at the expense of the the ability to recover and having a deep bench. But as for this undermining the republic, the constitution, you know what else undermined the constitution? The greed of the senators who wanted to consolidate land and power in their own hands at the expense of the common people. So they had a very selective vision of what did and did not constitute the Constitution. As I mentioned, the Constitution went beyond just laws and offices. And for this author, he apparently thinks that it was just a part of the written law that this is how armies are formed. It might not have been, actually. We don't really know. Because, again, the Roman Constitution was not written down. So he was just changing a procedure. The Romans had done this before. And while this procedural change did have a huge impact on the way that power was distributed and the way that leaders exercised that power, this was not some unprecedented thing to change an arrangement as needed so that the Roman army or the Roman system itself could continue to roll forward. And I believe also that this whole, I, this whole idea that Marius deliberately undermined the Republic through these reforms is ridiculous. Marius was responding to a crisis in the moment. And the arrangement that he made had some unforeseen consequences. And actually the first guy to take advantage of these armies being loyal to just one man wasn't Marius. It was Sulla. Key point. Prior to the Marian reforms, a Roman seeking to join the army had to meet a minimum property requirement of 3,000 sestercii. The typical salary of a Roman legionary, by comparison, was 900 sestertii a year. Needing more soldiers to further his military and political career, and defend northern Italy from a massive horde of barbarians, Marius ignored the minimum property requirement and opened the army to the propertyless Capite Sensi. And again, there are reasons why he had to do that that I've already talked about. So, yeah, it's not as if he just did this for the sake of doing it. And also, as a conservative, I'm sure it's very difficult for Mr. Tupi to denounce Andrew Jackson. But you know who did away with the property requirement to vote? Yeah, that'd be Andrew Jackson. So, Marius and Andrew Jackson are actually somewhat comparable, and both of them are fairly nasty guys on a personal level. So, actually, if you're trying to compare an American with a Roman, Andrew Jackson and Marius kind of works. That would be one I have to think about a little more, but I'm kind of feeling it right now. But Marius and Obama, what the fuck did Obama do that was anywhere nearly as interesting or significant as profoundly changing the nature of the military. Obamacare was a band-aid on a bullet wound. And there weren't really too many other major systemic changes that he enacted. What is the equivalent of this? The Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau, which basically just protects you from spam calls and makes it a little easier to get refunded if you get scammed? I mean, like, what... Uh, what did Obama do which fundamentally changed the game? Can you provide an example? The new recruits were poor, hungry for the spoils of war, and totally loyal to their commander, Marius. 
ignoring constitutional precedent, which banned the same man from holding the consulship twice in his lifetime, Marius, victorious in battle and supported by the swelled ranks of the military, got himself elected to Rome's highest office seven times, including five years in succession. All right, this will require a little bit of water and then some comments. So, apparently the poverty of these soldiers made them bad soldiers, or at least that is the implication of the way that this is phrased. I don't know that much about Marion Tupi, but I did look at a few of his other pieces, and he's one of those guys who believes that technology equals progress. So he's kind of, he's not the most um, like ardent social conservative type. He's very much a, techno a technologist, but clearly very, very elitist. And I think it shows here. They were hungry for the spoils of war, unlike any other soldiers ever served, right? Because... Yeah, American soldiers in World War II weren't totally looting Lugers at every opportunity. There was no rape of East Germany, and God only knows what the Germans did. And, I mean, fuck, are you kidding me? What war can you think of where soldiers were not hungry for the spoils of war? They're facing life and death, and they're looking for a way to create a nest egg for their families and to secure their futures. All soldiers who have the opportunity will engage in some degree of plunder. Make no mistake about it. It goes along with the territory. Just like if there is a brothel available and the soldiers have money, or sometimes maybe even if they don't have so much money, they will be availing themselves of this resource. What do you want me to tell you? That's just the way it works. As far as their loyalty to Marius, there's a reason for that. And the reason is that Marius won battles and got them spoils. And later on, it will become a problem where the commanders are expected to go to the Senate and get the Senate to vote money for the men to retire them, whether it's a payout or a land distribution. So let's say that you're someone like Pompey and you have a bunch of legionaries you're trying to retire, and then the Senate decides that they don't want to help you because it would make you a little bit more powerful and the hell with that. That's where the problem really arises. When the Senate decides that they really hate someone and they don't want that person's loyal men to get anything. And then that commander is in a bind where he has a lot of pissed off men under arms who are blaming him for them not getting anything. And then he has a choice. Do I stick with these guys who have been with me through thick and thin, who have put my name in the pages of history, or do I go with my asshole rivals who have done nothing and who are just trying to undermine me and leave my men in the lurch? That's where the problem came in. Had the Romans been more institutionally minded, say if there was a pension plan that automatically took effect, if they had a bureaucracy in place, something like that, then this wouldn't be a problem. It's not the professional army itself. It's the lack of a sufficient apparatus to handle it. As far as the constitutional precedent, again, this was a norm, not a law. And the reason is because the Senate was an oligarchy of three to six hundred men who shared power with one another on the principle that all of them were equally capable of exercising power by virtue of their birth and wealth. And the reason why they gave Marius this unprecedented honor is because, guess what? He was a really good general, and they needed a good general. The people trusted him, so the assemblies voted for him, and they gave him an extra command to make up for the failures of Caipio in the north, at Arausio. And again, the idea of the swelled ranks of the military, even if he had not done the reforms when he did, they would have still had to call up a bunch of men, they would have served under Marius, and then they would have been impressed by him and voted for him. So, this made no difference in the short run. So he held seven consulships. He was very successful. And that was unusual. But what really undermined Rome was not that. It was Sola's response to Marius, as we'll see. 
And keep in mind also, Marius was getting older. He will die in the year 86. The Senate had effectively sidelined him after the year 100. Marius in the 90s is kind of a discontented ghost. He's around, but he's not really that important or powerful. So, he betrayed one of his great rivals as he was outmaneuvered politically, Saturninus. But I've already talked about that story before. We don't need to get into the details here. The Optimates were apoplectic. They coalesced around Sulla and furnished him with a powerful army to wage war on King Mithridates of Pontus, but also, presumably, to keep an eye out for possible trouble at home. The army was strictly to go to Pontus. King Mithridates had overrun Asia and supposedly killed 100,000 Italian settlers, which is a ridiculous number, but it was some large number. And a lot of these men were equestrian or worked for the equestrians, so basically Sulla was being sent to defend the interest of Rome's business class abroad and to restore order to a province that the Romans had conquered and maybe add to it at Mithridates' expense. The idea was to reunite Rome after the social war by having a foreign war and also to punish Mithridates and defend Rome's interest. An army that was all the way in modern Turkey would not be able to keep an eye on Marius in Italy. No one needed to keep an eye on Marius at this time. Marius was not perceived as a threat at this particular moment. Marius' star had faded almost 15 years before. He had redeemed himself some in the social war, but Sulla was the superstar. Seeing his star fade, Marius bribed one of the tribunes. The tribune was an ally. Marius did not bribe him. To call a popular assembly, which overrode the decree of the Senate and gave Sulla's command to Marius. The assembly was sovereign, not the Senate. This was technically within their purview, at least as the Constitution was technically or ordered from about the early 3rd century to the present, or that being the time of Marius and Sulla. This was unusual, and it hadn't been done since about the Second Punic War, but this was technically not unconstitutional. This was an unprecedented attack on the power of the Senate, and Sulla resorted to the unthinkable. He commanded his legions to march on Rome. That actually was unprecedented. That was actually the break, not Marius using the assembly. In theory, Sulla could have gone back to the assembly with a more conservative-minded tribune, and there were some, and gotten the command back before Marius ever got to fight Mithridates. That would have been an option. Sulla also had a pretty big following at this time. As I said, he was the hero of the social war. He helped to hold Rome's control of Italy together. The Allies had been in revolt, and Sulla had been one of the key figures in bringing that revolt to an end. So, he had a lot of prestige and a lot of following, and even a lot of clout with common people at that point, as he hadn't really screwed them over in any way as of yet. The magic spell that kept Rome at peace with itself for centuries was broken. The magic spell was success. Rome had been marching forward and getting spoils. Now, those spoils were not distributed very well. Actually, as I mentioned, there were plenty of common people who were actually losing in this imperial system. But the magic spell, make no mistake about it, was success. The Marians fled, only to return after Sulla departed for Pontus. They killed many of Sulla's supporters, but their luck would not last. It's true that Marius and a politician named Senna came out of hiding after Sulla's initial march on Rome, and they did retake the city. But by the time that Sulla came back and initiated conflict with them in 83 to 82, both Marius and, Sulla, or, and Senna were dead. Senna was the real power behind this movement, and without his guidance, there was really no great leader. Marius, by this point, may have actually had a little bit of dementia. And he died, as I mentioned, in 86, so well before Sulla came home. The two leaders, by the time Sulla got back, were Marius's son, Marius the Younger, who was not really that big of a deal. 
and who was not his father, frankly, and a man named Gnaeus Papirius Carbo, who had been a senior lieutenant of Senna and was not really much of a general, which of course is a problem when you got to face Sulla, who's arguably the best general of the 80s. And yeah, they didn't stand a chance. Having concluded the truce with Mithridates, Sulla marched back and defeated the Marians at the Battle of the Colline Gate on November 1st, 82 BC. On that day, 50,000 Romans lost their lives, but worse was to follow. Yeah, it was a horrific battle, and as I mentioned, by this point, there weren't too many great leaders left on the Marian side of the equation. Carbo and Marius the Younger were on the run, they had been discredited. Um, the real senior leaders were dead. Many of the other senators in Italy were defecting. A young Pompey the Great ro rose up in revolt at Picenum and joined Sulla with an army that he raised himself. Um, I believe Crassus was on P Sulla's side. Plenty of senators left Rome to go join Sulla. Really, the prescription that happened... The slaughter of some 9,000 or so people who supported the populares in some prominent way was unnecessary. The Marian cause was completely defeated already. This was just retribution. It was pure vengeance. And all it did was cause the populares to actually form later on. Because this really let them know that the patricians did not regard them as being worthwhile or, on a certain level, human. So these grudges would really fester over the next decade or so. And even within the ranks of Sulla's own followers, as soon as he was off the scene, as he fell ill and retired, his chief lieutenants would really start to pick each other apart. As soon as Sulla was dead, there's an incident called the Conspiracy of Lepidus, this being the father of the man who was part of the Second Triumvirate. He was a prominent follower of Sulla, who basically tried to overthrow the Sullen order within a year of Sulla's death. So the idea that it was just the populares who opposed Sulla is ridiculous. And also, uh, Marius married into a patrician family, and his nephew by marriage, Julius Caesar, was not among the men that Sulla killed, even though Sulla considered it. A lot of the reason why the 9,000 people got killed is because Sulla and his followers wanted to take their estates. Because the prescription worked on the basis of, if you took out this person, there was a hefty headfinder, headhunter fee. So guys who were in debt, like say a young Catiline, could go out and murder people, and then bring proof of their deed to Sulla, and get a cash reward. That was the real purpose of the program in many ways. Sulla could eliminate people he didn't like, and reward his followers. If he wanted to get away with being his opponent, all you had to do was go to him and offer a bigger bribe than what he was offering as a bounty. And people did that too. This was a money-raising scheme. The choice was pay Sulla money or get killed, and your heir apparent will have to give Sulla money, possibly the entire state. That was the game. Sulla then proceeded to restore the ancient constitution. Asterisk. But I'll finish the paragraph first. He strengthened the optimites by declaring that all bills needed senatorial approval before they could be submitted to the popular assembly. The tribunes of the plebs lost their right to initiate legislation and were prohibited from ever holding another office in their lifetimes. They also lost their right to veto the acts of the senate. Sulla's new arrangement was not the ancient constitution. The ancient constitution, if he really restored, say, the original version, would have been quite a bit different. The senior officials might have just been two praetors. This was a new constitution that was modeled on the ancestral constitution. And really all it did was address the moaning of the conservative faction. It did not seek to address the problems of Rome systematically. It only dealt with the grievances of Sulla and his friends. And the main people that they hated were the tribunes. 
And the main reason Sulla hated the tribunes is because patricians weren't eligible to run for the office, so therefore the office's power should get its nuts cut off. Whoa. So that was his real reasoning. He did not want popular power to be exercised because he couldn't do it. It wouldn't benefit him at this juncture, nor would it benefit people like him. His thought was that the only people who served as demagogues or who presented a threat to the state were tribunes. So he was of that school that thought that the Gracchi brothers had been a grave threat to Rome's stability and that Marius had been a grave threat. He didn't seem to recognize that the failure of the Gracchi 50 years before to pass reform to land distribution had basically forced Marius to reform the military since the land system and the military were directly connected. So Sulla was not thinking institutionally. He was thinking purely ideologically. And you could even argue purely in light of his own experiences, since he, of course, was famously dicked over by a tribune who gave his command to Marius. Also, the tribunes have been doing this and it had a veto power for a couple hundred years at this point. So, Sulla was not actually acting as traditionally as he claims. But, whatever. To further solidify the power of the Senate, Sulla transferred the control of the courts from the equestrian order to the senators. He codified the minimum age for every stage of the cursus honorum, the sequential order of public offices held by aspiring politicians. And to prevent another general, like himself, from marching on Rome, Sulla decreed that all future generals would have to wait for 10 years before being elected to any office. First of all, that's actually an error. You had to be, it had to be 10 years between consulships, not between offices. You could be elected to other stuff after your consulship before being re-elected consul. And I believe the actual gap in effect might have been reduced not too long after this to a five-year gap. But the 10-year thing didn't really hold for too long. And it had sort of been the custom anyway to you know space out consulships to make sure more guys got to serve. And again, to share power among this oligarchy. As far as codifying the minimum age for every stage of the Cursus Honorum, it's unclear exactly how closely people followed this prior to it being codified. But because there had always been a mandatory time to serve in the legions for office holders. This had sort of been in place anyway. So this really was not a huge change. It just codified normal practice. So that in itself wouldn't really prevent a hostile takeover. And the 10 year rule didn't, didn't really take into account what could cause a general to gain great credibility which is taking command in a crisis and kicking ass with men that you raised and who are loyal to you. If your command gets extended because you're doing well, then it doesn't matter if it will take you another 10 years to formally become consul. So this reform in and of itself doesn't actually address the problem. Sulla then retired from public office and died of liver failure shortly thereafter. Actually, my reading of Plutarch suggests it was probably something like stomach cancer, but it doesn't matter. I guess Tupi's pushing the narrative that Sulla was a party animal, which again, I don't quite accept. No sooner was his body cold than ambitious politicians, including Gaius Julius Caesar, started to dismantle his legacy. Again, Caesar did want to dismantle this legacy, make no mistake about it, but he was only one of many, and it would take him several years to rise to any position where he could do anything. There were already people around who were doing the work for him, people who were ostensibly allies of Sulla, including the boy butcher Pompey, who went from being Sulla's golden boy to being a guy who did not fit in the Sulla system at all. And actually, Sulla was a complete hypocrite about enforcing the curse of Norum, because Pompey got to do whatever he wanted. He was immune from the curse of Norum because Sulla needed him and was indebted to him. 
So Sol- so Pompey is in his 20s, and he has the same privileges that normally you would need to be in your 40s and needing uh, and have held a bunch of offices to exercise. So the system was hardly foolproof. And then ironically, even though Pompey was actually the biggest beneficiary of Sola's system, he did a hell of a lot to unravel it. Caesar, who narrowly escaped Sola's assassins because of his Aunt Julia's marriage to Marius, Caesar was a marked man, would famously lead his army across the Rubicon in 49 BC, sack Rome, and becomes the city's first, though unofficial, emperor. There are people who hold that view. It's a respectable enough view. I actually do not consider Caesar to be one of the emperors. Apparently Suetonius does, and it's fine. It doesn't matter. It's just really a technicality on who you count first. I would say that since Octavian literally invents the office as it would be passed on, I'm going to give it to Octavian, who became Augustus, of course. The Roman people were far too enamored with their victorious general and addicted to the gold he brought back from the provinces to check his rising power and saw their freedom slip away. Um, the Roman legionaries were more enamored with Caesar than the people. Many of the people were actually annoyed at the Civil War and didn't really have very warm feelings toward either side. As people who were not legionaries, they were not going to get all that much out of this war except that their food supply might be restricted, depending on who controlled where they lived, and then where the food was grown. So if you lived in Italy, and the Pompeians controlled Egypt, well, they wouldn't control Egypt because Cleopatra was still in power, but they controlled North Africa, and the Caesarians control Italy, then basically you get fucked, even if you have no interest at all in this war. So for most people, that was actually the perspective that they would have held. Um, The Roman people did prefer Caesar to Pompey because he was a little more... Generous, he gave them more back, and in his will, he was pretty generous. He donated a bunch of public parks and gave everybody some money. He didn't really bring back all that much gold from Gaul, so I'm not sure what the hell Tupi's talking about here. As far as checking his rising power, again, the Senate and Pompey had to do that. The people in Rome had no real power. And again, if they had to choose between Caesar and then the Senate, a lot of them would probably be a little more inclined to go with Caesar because he gave them a little bit more, whereas the Senate offered them nothing. But most of them just wanted to be left the hell alone, and many of them were barely making ends meet, so they were not really caught up in this ideological struggle. They weren't really worried about their freedom slipping away because they didn't really have that much fucking freedom. Again, they had no political power. Many of them were working hand-to-mouth, The tenements that they lived in in Rome were often not earthquake-proof. In fact, Crassus, who's not really mentioned here, was a huge slumlord, and his buildings frequently collapsed and killed people. So what freedom did they have, other than the freedom to not to work for starvation wages, be unemployed on a frequent basis, and sometimes get drafted in the wars they didn't want to fight? And what was the freedom here for the average person? Why the hell would they care? Riddle me that, Batman. Like a latter-day Marius, Barack Obama has subjected the American constitutional order to a relentless barrage of unconstitutional acts. I can't wait to hear what they are. To be sure, Obama was not the first presidential, uh, president committed to extending the power of the executive. Duh. Since America's first progressive president, Theodore Roosevelt, those of both parties have had varying respect for the Constitution. Actually, the first president to start expanding the power of the executive was John Adams. And Abraham Lincoln also was a fairly aggressive executive. Uh, It's not just Theodore Roosevelt and the progressives, but of course, because Tupi's writing for Cato, everything has to be blamed on a side which is in some way inimical to his ideology, whether it's a liberal Republican such as Theodore Roosevelt or some Democrat like the other Roosevelt. As far as having varying respect for the Constitution, the Constitution is designed to take on amendments and to have some flexibility built into it. So just because you make some changes to the Constitution doesn't mean that you're failing to respect it. 
I think that's a very ridiculous and tangentious reading that if you want to change anything about it, you don't respect it. It'd be like saying if you have an old ancestral home that's falling apart and you want to replace a part and then, you know, your dickweed uncle says, you got to have respect for this house, boy. Can't be changing the shutters just because they're falling apart. Got to respect those shutters. Your grandpa nailed them up there 50 years ago. But Obama stands alone in having the U.S. Supreme Court strike down his legislation unanimously a record 44 times, far surpassing any other president in history. There's a lot of reasons for this, I might add. One is that we have this dipshit, dumb fuck idea of original intent that people like Scalia have spread and that many jurists have accepted. American law is way too based on precedent and it is idiotic. You need to consider whether the precedent is good or bad, whether the precedent makes fucking sense, whether the precedent is within the spirit of the law. And, okay, the Supreme Court struck down his legislation some a bunch of times, and it remains struck down. So if you're worried about Obama doing illegal shit, apparently he wasn't very good at doing illegal shit, and the system works. So the court-packing schemes of the Republicans apparently, are effective enough. Apparently, this is what Tupi was talking about with people being vigilant. And apparently, the system working is still reason to be worried. The future does not look much more promising. In her last debate with Donald Trump, Clinton said that she wanted to appoint justices who would defend women's rights back LGBT rights, support Roe versus Wade and reverse Citizens United decision and its ability to funnel dark money into elections. She added that she wanted a court to stand on the side of the people rather than wealthy donors and corporations. Fine sentiments to many a reader, no doubt, but what about the fidelity of the justices to the Constitution? That, alas, was completely absent from Clinton's answer. Okay, again... At this point, we all understand that the Supreme Court is partisan. And also, the idea of the Supreme Court is to prevent violations of the Constitution, not change. The Founding Fathers understood that there was a need for some degree of flexibility within the Constitution, hence the existence of the amendment process. So, yeah, this is exactly why people, when they're looking for justices, look for people who share their values. And then he'll complain about Trump maybe not being willing to pick the right justices. Asshole. Marion. You know good and goddamn well that Republican presidents, when they say what they're looking for in a nominee... We'll talk about conservative values, being anti-abortion, being pro-corporate, and basically just being the opposite of what Hillary is describing here. What she's saying is in no way controversial. This is actually one of the few times where Hillary gave an honest answer. This is what Democrats do, and Republicans just do the exact opposite. And it's all partisan hackery. Both sides believe they are within the bounds of the Constitution. Okay. Also, the whole idea that reversing Citizens United will get money out of politics and then we'll be on the side of the people rather than donors. The problem is, as I've mentioned on many occasions, you need to study the history of the 1970s and the three landmark court cases which allowed so much money into politics. Citizens United is just steroids for that existing problem. The problem itself goes back deeper. If we really want to address the problem of money in politics, you have to reverse a number of rulings, not just Citizens United. The people who talk about Citizens United are just looking at the surface level, and they don't know enough history. Okay, and then there is Donald Trump, whose public pronouncements indicate that he is yet to familiarize himself with America's basic law. I agree. Moreover, Trump's temperament suggests that he will encourage rather than restrain 
the ravenous appetite of the executive for more power. Accurate. That is exactly kind of what he did. I mean, Trump had no interest in rolling back the runaway power of the executive. So, actually, Marion, i got to give you credit. You do understand Trump. As I wrote in May, Trump's presidency is preferable to Clinton's only if you believe that the mercurial entrepreneur will do what he says and appoint the Supreme Court justices who respect the Constitution. That's a big if. But I imagine Toopy's probably pretty happy with the gallery of dickheads that Trump put on the court because all of them are ardent conservatives and corporate whores. So may, I wonder what Toopy thinks now about Trump. I'll have to look that up at some point. Sulla, whom his foremost biographer, meaning Plutarch, has graced with the moniker the last, actually this had to be modern, I don't think Plutarch would be stupid enough to say this, the last Republican was personally tremendously successful. He vanquished his enemies, achieved his political goals, and died doing what he liked best, whoring and drinking. Um, again, I don't think Sulla was quite as much of a party animal as Tupi seems to believe. The idea that Sulla was the last Republican is batshit insane. Batshit insane. Whoever wrote that book has a it should issue a retraction and an apology because that's a level of fuck up that kills all credibility. I mean, how is the guy who was who lived forty years before the fall of the republic, the last Republican? And also the guy who did more damage to the Republic than almost anyone else in its history. I, how the fuck is he the last Republican? That's like calling Mussolini the last Republican of Italy. I mean, what the fuck are you talking about? Institutionally, he was a massive failure. I agree. Sulla was not an institutionally minded man. Sulla failed to preserve the Republic not because of the inferiority of his reforms, but because of the indifference of the Roman people. Bull fucking shit. Sulla's reforms were very limited. All he did was check the power of the tribunes and make sure that people held offices at a certain age, if you really think about it. He also allowed the Senate to get bigger to make sure that more people could share power and it would relieve some of the pressure and relieve some of the malcontents who wanted to share in that power. It was also for administrative convenience because despite being supposedly someone who was obsessed with ancestral traditions, Sulla did understand the problems of administering the ever-growing republic. So that's why he enlarged the Senate to 600 members. He needed more people to administer more places, as should be obvious. But he did not really understand the root of the problem. And by his time, it might have actually been too late to do that much about it. Certainly by his time, something minor like what the Gracchi were proposing, which was just going back to the idea that the public land was public land and then using it for the good of the public, uh, that would have actually worked to delay the downfall of the Republic. You could also, if you start to divvy up land in foreign lands, that is to say places where Rome was conquered, you could also sustain the Roman model by settling people there. It becomes a little more difficult to go to them and then raise men because of the distance involved, but you can keep that system going if your goal is to maintain the Republic as is. Another solution is to go with Marius' system, but then set up a bureaucracy, a permanent fund, to make sure that these men are automatically and apolitically paid. That way, even if they have a kick-ass general, they won't have the need or the thought that this guy should go overthrow the Senate because their paychecks won't depend on it. So there are a lot of ways the Roman Republic could have could have proceeded here. But Sulla was just focused on his own experiences and his class prejudice. He was sick of seeing men who had no family name become tribunes, play to the plebs, get a, a laws passed they didn't like, and then become his equals by rising to the consulship. That was something he was sick of seeing even though very few of the men who served as Tribune made it very far. So he basically just neutered the position, and he thought that without the Tribuneship, things would proceed as normal. 
he did not he did not see a problem with the way things were going in Rome prior to Marius's reforms with ever increasing unrest. He didn't seem to link the actions of tribunes with actual suffering. The idea that people could get crowds riled up because crowds had grievances. This never occurred to Sulla. That's why his reforms failed. The Roman people were not indifferent to the problems of Rome, but they were incapable of enacting change because they did not have the institutional mechanisms to do so. The only thing resembling that was the tribuneship. But again, the tribunes were themselves members of the elite who then controlled what the people could do. So if you can neuter that office or put men in place who can impose their vetoes, which is what the optimates did later in the 60s and 50s, yeah, you can actually work with the tribune in place and still engage in obstructionism. In the end, it is not strong men, however gifted, that are the best defense against institutional decay, no shit, but the vigilance of the people, assuming the people have the power to be vigilant and that vigilance will have some sort of power behind it, animated by their commitment to the principles of constitutional government. And also you need to understand that the reason why more Romans were not outraged at the supposed crimes of the populares is because they were poor and suffering and they didn't get anything out of the Republic. The Republic offered them nothing. Why the hell would they care? What did they have to lose? They were never going to be consul. They were never even going to get paid. Um, the best they could hope for was that some wealthy senator would want to attract political support and would put on an awesome gladiator show at his aunt's funeral or some shit. And then they might get a meal out of it. I mean, that's really all they got out of this. You gotta understand, the Roman Republic did not offer anything to the common person that they didn't still get under the Empire. The liberty of the Roman Republic was limited to rich people. If you were someone who had a lot of money and could run for office, the Roman Republic was great. If you weren't, guess what? It didn't offer you a damn thing. And you had nothing to lose by watching the Republic be replaced by the Empire. Anyway, I am Thersites the Historian. I hope that you've enjoyed taking out the trash part two. When I return from vacation in a week, I will do parts three and four, and we will look at the pretentious ramblings of a boomer who thinks that he knows way more than he actually knows about Rome. So stay tuned for that. And of course, this guy also will be from the Atlantic, so we'll be looking at the democratic side of the aisle and some of the delusions about Rome that people who are ostensibly liberal have. So anyway... I'm Scythes the Historian, and I will see you all later.